Hi everyone, and welcome to the IPFS Core Implementations Weekly Sync for Monday the 25th of January 2021. I am Aking Brain, I will be your host. We're going to talk about our high priority initiatives, other initiatives, parking lot Q&A. If you've been to these things before, you know the drill by now. Um, we can start with the high priority initiatives, which the first item is upcoming and shipped releases. What is shipping? So we are, we are hoping to get the next 0.8 RC out this week. Uh, last week, a bunch of the you know, team was, was uh, preoccupied with, with research things, but uh, yeah, we will be attempting to get that out this week, including an updated version of uh, the IPFS distribution site, uh, which should make uh, deployments and letting people play around with it uh, a whole lot easier. Should also include an upgraded migrations binary that makes the migration to the next uh, release faster if you happen to have like a ton of pins. Yeah, bypasses loading in the memory. It's not the it's not the migrations overhaul. Just to be clear, that's that'll be a later release. That's what's currently waiting for review. So just don't want to confuse those the small uh, fix with the larger overhaul. Cool. Next up is pinning services. Uh, on the GUI side, we are wiring up uh, settings and file screens in preparation for release candidate two. Uh, we also plan to have a web UI release without pinning service integration to decouple uh, release from uh, when uh, pinning services are available and also to handle transition period when uh, web UI may be used with a backend which does not have pin remote commands. Um, I believe MFS out of pinning is in a state which is compatible with web UI, uh, but we are lacking docs and we need to retest it with Pinata. Um, I think that's it on my end. Um, there's the PR against JSIPFS for the HTTP client to add the commands. Um, yeah, I gave it once over, it all looks fine. Uh, there's just some conflicts that need to be resolved. I think it's going to be trivial. Yeah, I think if we could uh, just merge, like review, merge, and ship that, that would make things much easier on the web UI end because uh, NPM does not support those like. Uh, dependencies from a branch if the project is uh, in a subdirectory and I just IPFS uses Lerna, so that introduces additional step for testing. Uh, yeah, I mean, hopefully that should get better. Like NPM is getting into the workspaces game, so hopefully they'll work out how to make that work properly. But yeah, um, like I said in the review, it looks good. It just needs the conflict sorting out. Cool, uh, local pinning is next. There's nothing. Uh, there's nothing particularly new here. Uh, this is, I think, on pause until we decide if we're, uh, if when we're allocating more time to change the API for local pinning and add a new command for that and all that jazz. Fair enough. Uh, a wild Hannah has appeared. And you could give an update on data transfer speed improvements. Yeah, um, uh, so I just copy pasted uh, something from a wrap up email, so it's a little long, but um, we've, we've uh, things are going pretty well on this uh, path. We've shipped, uh, I mean, we shipped a bunch of uh, improvements to GraphSync, not uh, directly related to the data transfer, but sort of like preparatory work, kind of lining everything up. We've started to get our testing infrastructure in place. Um, and we're taking some preliminary steps towards implementing what we hope will be some good solutions. Um, I'm thinking long term. I like. I feel really good about the solutions we are coming up with. The hardest part is going to be finding. Well, probably is very hard to find a solution that will offer dramatic improvement without requiring clients or like requiring clients to upgrade to get that improvement or requiring the network to upgrade to get the best, the most improvement. Um, so that that's going to be a little bit of a challenge because you know, like trying to work 
just with what exists in IPFS, uh, BitSwap and GraphSync in like deployed IPFS 0.5 or whatever, it's gonna be uh, it's gonna be hard to get major improvement working just with that. But we'll we'll do our best. So, yeah. Um, so we're we're making progress. Um, yeah. Awesome. Is there? Did we schedule the uh, sync up <laughs> that's, for tomorrow? That's my other Monday morning to do. Yeah. I need to cool. go. Uh, next one is JS improves discoverability and connectivity. Yeah, so I started thinking about the connection manager overall uh, design last week. Uh, I am creating a design proposal uh, for for it, and it should probably be ready to for feedback this week. So I will probably ping the JS folks in Europe. Also, that is done, but probably it might be good to have a design discussion next week. That's it. Cool. FYI, one of the one of the things um, Alex and Nadine were talking about a little bit ago is like kind of next next priorities for the group and trying to get everybody back into being focused on more collective issues instead of everybody kind of on separate stuff. So some of the stuff we talked about is like finishing up working together to finish up the TypeScript stuff, and then looking at like what do we need to do to fix the DHT in Node.js or at least get that more performant. Um, so we may try to try to swarm on that and maybe borrow somebody from Go, um, like Batar or Adin, who have done a lot of that DHT work last year um, to help mitigate those gaps so that we can deliver that work a bit more quickly. Um, nothing in stone yet, but so continue with your proposal, but we may want to focus that so we can have like you, Hugo, and um, Alex all being able to, to work on the DHT together. Uh, yes, but uh, don't you think that we should at least have uh, some improvements on the connection manager that would be important for the HD? We will need to look at that and figure out what that what those changes are for the DHT and what we'll need to, to do that. But again, right, like this could involve focusing on the DHT doesn't mean three people in the DHT repo, right? It's mm -hmm. let's make sure that we're, we're fixing all of these systems in tandem to achieve the goal of more performant JS DHT. Also, in general, the the DHT where you don't require everybody to be connected to you to stay in your routing table should like ease up on connection pressure a lot. Okay, that's the end of the hyper priority initiatives. Uh, moving on to the other initiatives, uh, touch group integration is the first one. Hey, it's me, right? Okay, so we merged a bunch of the uh, a bunch of PRs, the data stores, data store FS, data store level, data store core interface, uh, data store, a uh, bunch of stuff. Uh, so with this, the IDFS repo types PR is almost done. Um, uh, just missing like two PRs in the multi hashing sync and um, a Jira PR. And I'm still thinking about what to do with the migration, just ignore it for now or PR the migration. So if you, anyone wants to help with migrations, feel free. Uh, we finally figure, figured out how, uh, how to do the proper documentation. Uh, being the documentation generated from, from the types, automatic generated from the types, uh, that actually works now. So the, the, the tool that we use to do that um, release a new version. So now it actually can understand better the common JS code instead of just uh, ESM. So we will finally be able to have like nice docs for the APIs without like jumping through a million hopes to make it look good uh so that's fun and yeah i think that's pretty much it for me um i started working on the unix fs importer and exporter um which meant i started working on uh, ipld dag pb which meant i started working on protons and i'm currently in hell right now <laughs> welcome welcome to my world 
But uh, yeah, so all the data stuff unlocks the repo, uh, which then unlocks BitSwap, which means we can then start bubbling this stuff up to, um, to YPFS, which is gonna be great. Cool, uh, next is Badger, not two, but three support. Uh, no updates on that at this point. Um, I think we're, at this point we're still waiting. Do we want to go ahead and create a, a new repo for that? Um, I don't think there's been a decision on that. I'll defer any more to Adin. Yeah, I think um, we should write an issue and, and get some feedback from the, the you know, Badger 2 using folks. But I think that after talking with, with Daniel about this a little bit, probably the best option is just to use a, a branch just use like branch versioning and and release and release tagging. Uh, yeah, I trust him that even though the the Go mod like website is like we recommend using like you know subfolders that this is something that is no longer a good idea because Go path is not used everywhere anymore. Will is nodding, so he seems to agree. Yeah, I think I think, and the only real question at that point is: Are we making another tag or branch in the Badger two repo, or are we trying to combine all of these different versions of Badger into just the Badger repo, which would sort of make more sense? But we've already went in this other way of having repos per version. Um, and right, like, why are you getting Badger three out of the Badger two repo? That starts to be somewhat unintuitive. Is the unfortunate thing, right? I, I would. Um, if we were gonna use one repo, I'd probably put them all in the Badger repo for, for sanity purposes. Yeah. Yeah, or or, or do we just, or, or we could just forget that the Badger 2 repo existed, just deprecate it and- But yeah, but this if is we're why willing we'll to do that, that GitHub is issue. maybe the this, easiest. This is why we'll use a GitHub issue in the Badger repo and continue from there. Right, right. <laughs> Uh, next up is not traversal. Yeah, so Arsh had the PSC, POC of TCP and quick hole punching working. Um, he's currently working on cleaning up those PRs because he did a lot of hacks to get around some of the interfaces for that. Um, so he's working on cleaning that up. And then we just need some reviews on the IM client multi-stream extension um, for the spec. Um, Arsh is looking at putting together a proof of concept of hole punching coordination over DHT servers. The idea being if we can reasonably allow DHT servers to do limited bandwidth hole punching coordination, um, then we could just leverage our existing infrastructure to do a lot of that um, instead of running expensive relays. So one of the things he's looking at doing is determining what the actual like bandwidth rate is for coordinating that. So we can then calculate based on the connections to DHT servers, how much coordination, how much traffic do we anticipate going through those to coordinate hole punching. Um, so just to prove concept right now, not that we'll eventually use it, um, but once we have that data, then we can make a determination of, is this worth going down that path? And what does that look like? So this is evaluating whether having DHT nodes serve as, you know, upgrade relays is is even feasible. Right. Like if we did bandwidth rate limiting on the DHT relays, right? Because like we don't want to open them up as relays. Um, so understanding what is that bandwidth um, management that we need to do, um, because in most instances, right, when you go to find somebody, you're going to query to the closest people them. So if I can just get hole punch coordination with my 20 closest peers um, that that provides a lot of value of being able to get that final content. Um, so just determining like how feasible is it, how expensive would it be on those DHT nodes? Um, yeah, to make a cost assessment really there. Interesting stuff. Um, so next Can up we not is... estimate that from existing auto relay? Like we've got an existing coordination thing off of auto relay, right? Um, can we have that net bandwidth and then spread it over our estimated size of DHC to get an estimate of what that is going to be? Because it should be the same protocol for doing I think the coordination. That's what it's doing, right? Okay. Yeah, Jacob, yeah. is that yeah? Uh, yeah. But it's just getting those numbers of in practice versus 
Yeah. Do you, Will, would you mind following up with, with Arsh and, and probing a little bit about what the, the path he's going there? Um, sure. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Next question on the list is Unix of SV 1.5 in Guy PFS. Um, it doesn't look like there's an update. There's no activity on the issue. Uh, so moving on to Guy PFS GC improvements. Yes, actually, uh, Friday was uh, testing one of the uh, um, the, or the prototype that I've come up with so far, and uh, yeah, there are some improvements. There are some also big problems with it that I I had to figure out how to address, and I will fold that those findings back into the current design doc. Um, one of the things that came out of that though was I'm looking at performance. Uh, some DHT related issues since we've been discussing that here. You may have, some of you may have seen the discussion uh, that happened on the IPLD channel. And it, uh, conclusion was that we have a couple areas that are causing uh, performance to be hovering around 15, 20% on most of the nodes and they're able to cut down on, on my DHT connections. Um, and it seemed to scale the, the, uh, the idle um, CPU busyness seemed to scale with that. Anyway, so that's that, that may branch off into some other performance related discussions of things we need to do. But as far as the GC is concerned, um, yeah, there, there are some improvements, but there's also some, some things that, it, that I'm gonna to have to probably ask some questions about how we, you know, how we want to solve that. So the prototyping work is going forward, but it's not like, yay, all the problems are solved yet. It's like, okay, we've solved some, but I think I've created some new ones possibly. <laughs> so it's just continuing on with that. Uh, the GC update, but yeah, we, I think there will be a, we need to branch out into some other discussions for DHT if that's not already being addressed by some of the, the efforts there. Um, so clarify, the, the DHT thing was not, if I understood, that was just, that was like a loop P2P thing where the, they're getting lots of system calls. It's, there's two, yeah, there's uh, the number of um, packet handles, handling of the packets, particularly the incoming packets, was responsible for a large amount of the idle CPU usage, where it kept, uh, it would keep an eight core uh, i7 humming at around 15 to 20 percent CPU with the default configuration, and then that just, you know, a, a steady state after, after running for half an hour. I wonder if there's some weird system configuration things. I know on on Windows, which happens to have all the bugs, but sometimes the bugs are performance improvements. Uh, it is like zero, it's like 1%. Yeah, think. and I'd like to look at this. So this the report is, was across all three platforms. It was, it was, it, like, it was in Windows though. Yeah. So I, I didn't have it on Windows. So I ran it on, it was running on uh, Linux and AMD 64 Linux, uh, uh, a, Mac, uh, a MacBook Pro and a free BSD machine. And all three of them exhibited similar performance profiles with the default configuration. And this was all on either the uh, RC1 or the, um, or the current build of, the, of you know, the current stable or the stable like current development branch. So if there is a, if there is a platform that's not experienced that, it, you know, what's the difference and uh, what are we doing? So one of the biggest things, looking at raw profiler data, and I don't want to take up the meeting with that, but you know, just the number of go routines and then the scheduler was, you know, was going crazy and running around looking for things to run was part of the problem. But I was able to reduce the uh, DHT connections by a factor of 10, and then idle CPU uh, went down um, by about a factor of 10. But a lot of that was in quick versus other protocols. That's also. correct. So it, it may was, well it, be it, that there's something in terms of how quick is scheduling and setting up its go routines. Exactly. Because we previously difficult. had this many go routine, this many connections in DHT. So it's not necessarily um, just you have like, it, it, it's less you have a lot of connections and more you have a lot of quick connections that seem to be the correct and, and it was specifically in quick and I can I can share the profile uh, I did a number of profile runs they all came out pretty similar and it's all in quick and uh, it's all packet handling and a good portion of that is in memory allocation so we, something we should probably open an issue up uh, issue to look look into is the quick uh, performance That'd probably be worth pinging Martin, uh, Martin Seaman, so he can take a look at okay. that. Yeah, he's a maintainer of that repo, I believe, right? Yeah, and he's in our Slack. Oh, okay, yeah, I'll definitely. He's on uh, Team let me, I will share with the. I have uh, profile uh, pictures for him then. Yeah, perfect. Uh, 
Uh, do you want to skip straight on to the next one? Which is the Go OpenVest migrations rework. I am waiting for a review because we haven't really had time to do a review of that. There's a lot of there's a lot of work in there, and I think as I said last week, still it's the the distributions needs to get approved and merged, and everything else comes behind it. Uh, no more work uh, is necessary unless review unless a review uh, points out there is. Um, I'm excited to get that in because it's it looks like a it'll be a huge improvement and it'll offer uh, going forward a way to actually sanely write migrations without uh, a gigantic amount of hassle. Um, so very happy about, about that being there. And when we have time, uh, it'll, it'll be reviewed and merged and uh, accordingly, according to uh, relative priority. Yeah, I think it's basically like step one is do the next RC, which includes the uh, update to dist. And then once that's done, we can start to like look in merging in these other ones um, because they all they all sort of build off of that because the new yeah you know, all these all these PR to disk makes everything make a little more sense. Um, cool. Next item is the IPFS pub sub API revamp. Um, there is no sign of Gozada. So, there's a device coming in update. It's so moving on to the uh, memory leak and JSIPFS. Did you get any of that, Hugo? Uh, yeah, no, no update on this. Uh, I left some comments in the PR, waiting for some feedback, and uh, I just uh, did a bunch of work on the types, and this is paused for now. Next one is the JSLib TCP testing setup. Yeah, so the current pressuring uh, problem here uh, with our testing setup is that uh, libp CI files in uh, Node 15 and NPM 7. Uh, I basically created a proposal and a proof of concept uh, linked in a node. The main issue is uh, circular dependency because we have our libp modules depending on libp and Lipid2P uses uh, the Lipid2P modules as dev dependencies to test them uh, with integration tests. And this basically makes with the new NPM7 changes that installs automatically uh, the peer dependencies to basically have a mismatch of versions. So yeah, the short-term goal here would be to move the integration testing out of uh, Lipid2P to the Lipid2P modules, and then we could support Node 15. And in the long run, uh, we should probably create uh, uh, some system testings using test grounds and uh, follow up with the uh, interop. And probably we should also discuss afterwards in this context, the eventually moving the Lipid2P repo to a learner repo following the wins of the IPFS one. And yeah, that's it. It would be good to have feedback on this. That is it for the uh, other initiatives. Um, moving on to the rest of the items, uh, design review proposals. Anybody got anything you want to propose for a design review? Um, I now that that uh, Hannah and Alex are back, um, I I put up a, a bit swap proposal um, around large blocks. Um, this isn't something that we're necessarily going to tackle right now, but uh, I want to sort of get like some sanity checks to be like, does this make sense? And also think, you know, I guess, see how see how you think this fits in with some of the other stuff that you are you are planning. Um, Dean, so. I actually did. I read your proposal. I'm sorry, I haven't made any comments. Um, uh, my, my, I'm trying to want well, uh, let me let me I shouldn't I should discuss with you offline, not in. We can, yeah, we, yeah, 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 yeah. We can do this another time, but this is the, yeah. yeah I like to, I like to get this on the, the conversation at, at some point. Sure. Yeah, for sure. As a sort of a, a, a topic related um, to saving blocks, there was a, there's a, uh, an issue out there that there's been some conversation on concerning a streaming, a proposal for streaming uh, data directly into a file and bypassing the block store. And that that offered some interesting possibilities for some things I was running into um, 
uh, just looking at when we have very little size left to, to write blocks and, and ways around that. I don't know if that's something we, I just wanted to bring that up in case that's something that we yeah. want to formalize as a design is not just an issue. Well, I'm curious, do we have the file store in IPFS yet? Because there's like already a thing in, this is slightly different yeah. than the other end of things. This is like when you import a file, you don't actually put it in the block store, you just leave it on disk um, and then like put reference mm -hmm. into the file. Oh, the zero copy option? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it's super problematic in implementation because it's like all kinds of problems that introduces because people could delete the file off their system um, and you have no way of knowing. But uh, but I'm just curious, do we have that in IPFS? Because that is a thing over in like Filecoin land, they use that. Yeah, I mean, the, the file store the file store exists. Uh, I don't think it does any of the things that one might expect, like have the OS mark files as read-only so you don't blow them up while you're... <laughs> while you're using them or, or whatever yeah. but but the file store is is there i think it's experimental um yeah okay I, turn it on. I mean it's certainly it's certainly to me it's not, like i don't think it would be hard to i mean it, in theory it would not be hard to stream a uh like something you're getting from bitswap or wherever from the dag service into uh directly into a file instead of saving it in theory, I think the current architecture of the software may make it a little bit challenging because, I mean, and this is something I'm gonna have to look at in BitSwap in general is like BitSwap is pretty like hard coded to like save right to the block store once it, you know, gets a block. Um, and we probably, we have to it, in minimum introduce a layer of indirection there because there's a million scenarios where you might want to put it in a different block store. You might want to put it in a file. Or you might want to not put it in a block store just yet. You know, there's like a bunch of, Bunch of reasons to do that. Um, obviously, BitSwap also like super integrated with the providing system, which is going to be a real fun thing. So all of that is going to have to be somehow broken apart, and that's probably going to be software that Alex and I write. <laughs> and when we do, we'll get back to you about the streaming go file. <laughs> <All right. laughs> yeah, it was just it was one of those things like, oh wow, this would be awesome. <laughs> like, okay, yeah, I wrote this, and I looked like, well, yeah, that gets pretty complicated. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's the, it's not complicated in theory. It's yeah, complicated because it's, it's our architecture. What? Conceptually, it's fairly straightforward. But yeah, like you said, you really need a layer of indirection uh, so that you don't have to worry about what you're writing to. You know, here's your incoming block. Something else takes care of wherever it's going to put them and arrange them and be it a file yeah. or a block store or whatever. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you may see that like the next few PRs we submit are further like not improving performance, but re-architecting software so it can be used to improve performance. Right, so I guess my point is that, that maybe a, a there should be a, a design proposal or someone should think about putting one out there just for that layer, which will then allow us to go go the next step further and build some of these things. That's a good point. Yeah, I mean, I think we should probably, I will, I can probably write one because I'm gonna have to do that pretty soon to implement the stuff we want to do, so yeah. Just awesome. conscious of the time here, we have just run over. Um, okay. So if anybody needs to drop off, please feel free. Um, but if that's it for the design review proposals, we can move on to the blockers and asks. The questions. Yeah, I, I've got a question. There's a, uh, someone filed an issue. I don't remember whether it was in the Go or the JS repo. Um, around the fact that IPFS import export is not like quite the same across Go and JS, basically because uh, JS had it first and uses like, you know, passwords to encrypt things and whatever. And, and Go is just like, you are going to send me a key and I don't know anything about passwords and, and any of that. Um, do we have, do we have a way to indicate, or should we have a way to indicate what HTTP client thing you're you're looking at? I mean, I, I guess we're trying to make them look the same, which is, I guess, where the problem comes up. Um, do, do we have like an interop test for this at all? I don't think there's any. I don't even think we have a spec either for that. Like in reality, we should we should spec what that's supposed to do out, and then write the tests and then write yeah. the code. I mean, I thought we were, 
We talked once about removing the key manipulation stuff from the HTTP client, didn't we? Well, like we need from the client because we need, we need for the, the bin, right? To be able to, to export, export the keys locally in the command line. Um, but yeah, we should just have that discussion probably in this, that interface design for that interface spec for the client, the HTTP API and, and figure out exactly what that thing is supposed to do and then unify it if it makes sense to do that across the two implementations, which it probably does. Yeah, for, for context, uh, the Go IPFS currently allows you to import a key, but does not allow you to export the key if the node is online. Um, because we <laughs> work, work to be done on uh, API security from a local uh, things running on your local machine. How do you tell who's asking you to make these commands? If that's it. For yeah, the I, I guess sort of related to that potentially was um, Jen was asking me if we should do some sort of blog post or write up about the security workshop. And one of the things that I realized I was very unsure about is, are we going to talk about any of the things that came out of that as community desires, as things we're going to do, uh, or are these just things that people talked about? Uh, and and that's you know, you know, are we going to be trying to deal with you know different application profiles? Are we going to be dealing with this HTTP permissioning of SIDS? Um, we should have some sense of. So so my answer was let's wait a week until prioritization happens more and we have a sense of you know timeline of you know how much effort any of us are going to be working on any of that before we try and set expectations yeah i think likely a week is too soon for the priorities because that's still happening right now um the thing that i think is going to happen regardless is that we're going to end up in a situation where this the security issues here are, are a use case that we are trying to unblock as a core development and protocol development team. And what we want to do is make sure that people like Pierre Goss and everybody else that was on that call have the ability to easily extend IPFS to do those things. Um, and maybe we'll at least guide, if not participate actively in, in the development of those, but really make sure that you have the ability to compose IPLD and IPFS in the block store and whatever else is needed to do that. And so we need to work to make that easier to build off of. Um, and then perhaps we'll also help build those features out. So I think that's kind of like the minimum set that we'll look at for, for this year that will very likely happen. I think it's just the degree of which we'll be involved in that still needs to be determined. Right, but the I mean the the most concrete one there was this like um, SID permissioning in BitSwap, and the initial proposal is somehow based on HTTP headers, which are coming into a gateway-ish thing. They want to then have their BitSwap session be able to decide on permissioning against some sort of external API that it passes headers to. And there's I think at least some rounds of design that probably we have opinions on at least that need to happen uh, for something like that to actually exist. Um, so that may be the, the ask is we probably need to review that initial uh, issue that came in and start thinking about what a design that's plausible actually looks like. I suspect for that, like the, the thing that's like the bigger engine that we need to worry about is uh, how, you know, as part of a bit swap request, you send a token that grants you access to something and then plumbing that through the HTTP like client responses are, are like highly bike shuttable, but also kind of not relevant. Either way, we're not gonna sort that out in this meeting. Um, so the final section is the parking lot. There's two items in the parking lot. One is DAG selector CID cache. Uh, yeah, this is something I I just want to put this on people's horizons, probably a ways off. Um, but um, uh, and also I only because I saw something in Andrew's update that suggested some similar similarity. Do we currently have anything in um, GoIPFS that like 
tracks uh like a root CID to all its children or anything like like uh like stored in the I know we have a block store do we have a, a dad store of any kind what do you mean you want to be able to do a query that takes in a root CID and then gives you a list of all of its children without actually traversing a DAG? Yep. yep. No, we traverse DAGs. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, this may be something we look at in down the line um, in terms of uh, like speeding up uh, grass sync, um, uh, especially as we look at moving towards grass sync as like a thing that can serve you. Um, like lists of CIDs. Um, I think there's a lot of other things that it might come into play on. I only want to, like, again, this is like just an idea. It's like very germinating. Um, uh, it might, like, I mean, that's like, I don't know if it would help with GC to be able to, like, you know, do something like that. Um, uh, I mean, it probably by the time it's implemented, it won't be a DAG query. It won't be like a DAG store. It'll be like, or like a whole DAG store. It'll be like a root CID and selector query. Um, where we're just recording things as we serve a graph sync request. Um, and then uh, and then the next time we do it, we might be able to serve it much faster by like just loading the blocks and sending them. Um, anyway, that's like, you know, just a it's, it's a far off thing, but it, it could come into the mix in terms of speeding up some of this stuff. So yeah. So that actually has some implications for what garbage collection can do. And so far I've avoided that just because of the sheer amount of memory it can take up. Uh, for large, uh, if you have a lot of a lot of objects that have that are, that are deeply uh, that have a lot of deep dag, um, to yeah, them. yeah. But if if they're going forward with design, yeah, I'd be very interested in at least uh, staying up with that because you know keeping yeah. up with whatever the thoughts are there because that does have direct sure. implications of what I could do with garbage collection. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that, uh, that's why I just wanted to put it as something that you know something I'm thinking about. Um, yeah, I mean, I imagine it could take a lot of space, but I mean, like, I mean, CIDs are 40 bytes. I would imagine that in comparison to the block store, it's just going to be like, not going to be a huge thing. Um, but I mean, obviously, we need to find out if that's a true assumption. It's possibly not a true assumption. I find it if it all has to be loaded, if it's kept in memory, it is. I guess that's the thing. Is the oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was the thing. Is it all in memory, then that's the problem. If it's not in memory, then no, it's not. Yeah, yeah, it would be like an on disk thing you could load real quick to serve a query or maybe to help you with GC if you needed it, you know. So, okay, yeah, anyway, ways off, don't worry about it. Like, <laughs> um, oh, the, the other, other person to oh, the other person to ask about that is Reba, who's been doing a Postgres based data store, uh, in the Falcon context that is keeping some metadata information. Like I know the, all, I, I, I'm, I'm deep in, with, so, in, talk, in conversation cool. with those folks. Yeah, it's, it's evolved. So that may allow you to do some of that preloading if yeah. you're using that data store. Yeah, they're, they're, they're moving into a bunch of different things. They're actually no longer on Postgres. They've moved on. I think they're going to do LMDB as the immediate one, followed by Go New DB. It's actually really interesting. Uh, so that's, that's the core Lotus stuff. I would still talk with Reba. Oh, is he's got something else going continuing on. further oh. down a Postgres route that is doing okay. full DAG cool. metadata stuff. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah. We, by the way, we may want to keep vague awareness of what they're doing over there because they're just because they're doing a lot of data store testing. And we might, it might be like it's somewhere where, like, oh, we could do this too and get a big improvement. Um, though I don't know if the profiles of the way we use things are, you know, the same uh, so that it would make sense. Sorry. Okay, that was long. Uh, I'm just going to quickly go on to the other parking lot item, which is really quick, which is me. Um, I am just curious. I I randomly reached out to Chris ha Happy Happy, um, who at one point was working on a JS graph sync, um, and he uh said he's no longer contracting with PL, um, which I assume means there is no one on JS graph sync at the moment. Um, uh. So I, I mean, you know, like I, I don't like um, I don't exactly know. Does JS actually have like BitSwap fully going yet? So like maybe it's like a long way off to even worry about. But um, you know, especially if we're going to be like banking on GraphSync being a thing into YPFS that enables fast data transfer, like it would be a bummer if we couldn't do it ever in JS. So I don't know if that's even a concern. Yeah, we just did JS uh, handoff on GraphSync because um, oh, Chris okay. can't, can't currently work on it, but he might come back work on it later. Um, ah. So we'll probably pause on that until we have a better picture of what exactly we're doing on Go. Um, okay. But okay. there is a working version of that in the repo. I added the repo to the notes. 
Um, oh, okay, perfect. We'll migrate that over at some point in time. Um, but th that also has working examples of that pulling from Go, but I don't believe it works the other way currently. Yeah, yeah, he was doing some like very preliminary, let's just see if I can fetch something from Go. So yep. yeah, that's great, perfect. Okay, uh, sorry, I know I make meeting go long. I think that is it. I think we are done. Thank you for sticking out if you uh, made it this far. Uh, this has been the uh, IPFS Core Implementations Weekly Sync for Monday, the 25th of January, 2021. Please fill in your async updates so people know what is happening. Uh, otherwise, you are free to go. Uh, enjoy Burns Night. I hope you're drinking whiskey already. Bye. <laughs>